Hi, I'm Joseph Berardo. At MagnaCare, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Ollendorf Center, Cohn Resnick Accounting, Tax, and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results, the Fidelco Group, Fedway Associates, and by United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. So, I'm with you. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. It's been a while, but we have him back. He is the most popular county executive in the nation. My good friend, Joe DiVincenzo. Joe is the county executive in Essex County. Uh, we're not here to talk about politics. Thank you. I, I appreciate <laughs> it. You could do that. It, on, it could be very boring. Then. No, no, no. We'll, we'll do that on Capitol Report. Okay. We're, we're here to talk about zoos, more specifically. Turtleback Zoo. One zoo. Turtleback Zoo. Turtleback Zoo. Now, that's not, we're not just talking about any zoo, Joe. We're talking about a zoo that a few years back... Not, Give people a sense of what it was and then what it is. Well, first of all, in 1995, when I was president of Freehold, the board of previous administration wanted to close down Turtleback Zoo. The reason for it, revenue was down, attendance was down, and there was a question about the animals not being treated properly. Uh, so uh, they made a recommendation, suggestions to me, that they wanted to close Turtleback Zoo. What I did was organize a committee of uh, community people to travel around the state of New Jersey to look at other zoos and to come back with a recommendation. Some of those people you know. Barbara Bell was on the committee, right. uh, Lou LaSalle, John Smith, and Frank McInerney. And he traveled to all the zoos and they came and made a recommendation and said, listen, we should keep it, we can make it go. So what we did was, uh, we did that. But we also had a large community support that came out and supported us. We're going to be showing and says, video. Let's, let's, and says, let's keep it open. But you know what's interesting? We're looking. Hey, folks, you went to the video right away. Trust me, that's not what the zoo looked like in 1995. That's what the zoo looks like today. Joe, that is, let's just jump into it. That's the sea lion. That's exhibit. the sea lion. That's we were there the day this opened. Was the governor there that yeah, day? Yeah, the governor was there. The governor cut the ribbon. That's a $5 million uh, exhibit. It's, it's our newest exhibit, and it's so popular. The kids love it because there's a touch dike in there. There's stingrays, and there's sea lions they can see either underwater or above ground, and the kids just love it. You can see it right now, how the, they're in there actually touching them, feeding them. You know, they're up close and personal with them, and they're learning. It's all about uh, education. And, Joe, for, and we'll talk about the education piece in a minute. For a lot of kids, I mean, you grew up on Parker Street in Newark. I grew up a block away on Highland Avenue in Newark. We I, didn't, I didn't have a pet, Steve. Uh, we didn't have, well, we had ours. I didn't know if, uh, uh, I, want, I don't want to say it on TV. Uh, we won't say it. We grew, <laughs> trust me, but we grew up in Newark. There weren't a lot of pets. In the, leave it alone. But here's the thing. We didn't see a lot of these animals. Not, not at all. Right? Not at all. Is that a big part of it for you? You know, the part of it is that this zoo has been there for 50 years. And for the first 40 years, and because of budget pro crisis, you know, the first thing goes about the quality of life. And what I tell you, it says, listen, it's about a quality of life, but it's also about economic development. And when I became... Whoa, whoa, whoa. How is, zoo, how is a zoo about economic development? Because if you go up there and look at our complex here, the Essex County South Mountain Recreation Complex, we have an arena, two ice arena. We have a, a zip lines up there called the Treetop Adventure. We have a golf course. We have McLoons. Hold we on, have you got McLoons, which McLoons is restaurant. Tim McLoons. You got McLoons, which is a great restaurant, folks. But also, what about the paddle boats for we the paddle orange, boats. Res orange Reservoir? Paddle boats there that we just opened up last year. It's been very successful. But besides that, we just opened that. What are we looking, are we looking at right there? May 5th, that was part of the paddle boat area. And we have uh, around the reservoir, we redid the whole thing where we put bridges over the dams. And we there's a two-mile track that goes around the entire reservoir. People could work out there, just see the scenery. Imagine to be having something like that on you know, 2,000 acres of open space. It's just beautiful here in Senesic County. And to me, it's about economic development. Development, And that's what my mentor taught me over 40 years. Of course, it was your father. Well, I appreciate you saying that. You know, Joe D., 
and I grew up in the same neighborhood. Um, Joe's considerably older, as you can tell. Not much. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Joe, it's interesting. Joe has had a fascinating career. He was a former uh, professional football player. Well, uh, if yeah, you talk are. to Charlie Weiss from Kansas, I, I never was on any team, so I don't think well, I Joe, could Joe say that. Joe tried out for multiple <laughs> uh, NFL football teams, um, was an All-American athlete. But what's interesting is that he had a career in recreation and then got into public life. And in many ways, your public life, Joe, in all seriousness, while we go back a long way and we're close friends, your public life, so much of it, has been about trying to find ways for kids, young people, to recreate. Yeah, well, that's, listen, that's important, especially in an inner city like ours, especially you know, in the city of Newark. You know, kids need an outlet, and we were there, and I was very fortunate to work with your father at the North Ward Center. I started the recreation program there at the North Ward Center, and then I went on to the Newark Public Schools system, became a teacher, coordinator of athletics on a bigger scale, and we were able to do some great things in the city of Newark. But let's get back to Turtleback Zoo. I knew you were coming back to it. You know, well, you since I've from... taken over in 2003, yeah. My team, not myself. There's no I in team. There's you no said that. I in team. The attendance <clears throat> at that time was only 160,000 people. Today, our attendance hit over 621,000. Well, hold on. Just in, in, in a year, way back, it was what? Only a, the most people ever attend Turtleback Zoo in 40 years was 160,000 people. And now? Now we're over 621,000. Who are these people? Where do they come they from? They come from all over, not of Essex County, throughout the state of New Jersey, and also other states. Our zoo is the number one zoo in New Jersey. Our zoo is AZA. We got AZA a means? AZA means your accredited. federal accredited. accreditation? Yeah, there's 200, only at 220 zoos and aquariums that are actually accredited, which makes it good because we're able to deal with other zoos and be able to exchange animals and stuff. But let me get to the revenue part. The most money in 40 years... The zoo only made $600,000 a year. We're up to $5.3 million a year. Our zoo in New Jersey is the only self-sufficient zoo. What does that mean, self-sufficient? That, our, what it cost us to run Turtleback Zoo is approximately $2.7 million. So we make over $2 million, a little over $2 million of additional revenue at the zoo. So someone <coughs> wants to be critical and they say, wait a minute. What is the county executive doing putting all this county money, taxpayer money, into the zoo, you say? Well, it is taxpayers' money, but it's also corporate money. There's also private money that p people have bought into the zoo. Listen, people prior to me take, uh, becoming the county, we're trying to run to other counties to That's get right. out of our county seven towns. Today, you know, people, you don't hear that conversation anymore. That's right. They're very proud. We it's got great parks. We got great golf courses. We got a great complex up there. We got a, a great environmental center. We're the go-to place now. And, you know, I was walking around the waterway at Orange Reservoir, and uh, someone said, listen, this is a good use of taxpayers' money. I couldn't be more proud. I was against it in the beginning, but, Joe, you proved me wrong. You know, so this was the right thing to do. And know what our property value is here? Because he lived in West Orange are going to go sky high. Because Just because of it. what we've done with that complex. We made it a destination place, the Essex County South, Mac, South Mountain Recreation Complex. No longer do our residents have to go outside of Essex County to enjoy the quality. They stay right here in Essex County. You know what's County. interesting about what you're saying? People will say, well, you use my tax dollars. And I'm thinking, okay, well, <clears throat> you could use someone's tax dollars to waste it, or you could use someone's tax dollars to do something really valuable. Let, let me tell you something. That the last three years, our property tax increase has been 1.7% under the 2% cap. Over the last 12 years... Well, everyone be clear, there's a 2% cap in New Jersey. That's it. Go ahead. Over the last 12 years, our tax increase has only been 2.7%. Look what we have done. and We've turned this county upside down and improved every one of our facilities, every one of our roads, every one of our bridges, every one of our infrastructures. 2.7. It's the fourth lowest in the entire state. The only counties that are ahead of us is Cape May, Somerton, and Hudson. Uh, not Hudson, Hunterton. All the other counties our size raise taxes 6 7% a year. We've been 2.7%. I'm very proud of that. Our bond rating, when I took it over, it was junk bond. We had a huge debt. Today we have a $50 million surplus. Our bond rating is double A. By the way, Joe, double A too. And I want to be, is it 2.7 or 1.7? 1.7 in the last three years. Go ahead. But over the last 12 years, it's 2.7. Just to clarify. By the way, the county executive said he was not going to talk about politics at all. There he was didn't. No he talked about government. Talked all about government. That's what it is. All about tax policy. You know, good government is good politics. Did you just make that up now? No, that's been my <laughs> saying. We have a slogan: <laughs> put in Essex County first. But good government is good politics. 
Oh, man. Joe, it's good seeing you. Thank you for giving us an update on the zoo. And it's for everybody. You don't have to live in Essex County to go. No, it's for your kids, especially my goddaughter. Olivia. Olivia. I wasn't going to say know. that, but now i got to disclose. Well, you have to disclose. You disclose I'll, everything else. I'll disclose. Okay, you have Joe, never made Joe's, a financial Joe, contribution by my political Joe, election. <laughs> I did not. I made no, I I know made that. no contribution. But we didn't talk about Investors Bank. Investors Bank is the best. They're an underwriter of the show, and they're big supporters <laughs> of the zoo. And Joe is, in fact, the godfather of my beautiful, our beautiful daughter, Olivia. And um, Haley, your beautiful granddaughter. She's special. She's special. All right, Joe D., that's enough from you. We're going to a break right now, and Joe D. are going to have a discussion. We're going to have a discussion off the air, trust me. <laughs> Be back right after this. <laughs> to see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Alex Ishkanian is a playwright, librarian, Bryan Elementary School in Teaneck, New Jersey. Good to see you. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, this is part of our series we do in cooperation with the NJEA, this classroom close-up. Uh, Helping Drew is a puppet show that you introduced, right? Exactly. Um, I worked on it as the playwright and also composed the music and the lyrics and um, partnered up with a puppeteer, yep. uh, David Manley, and uh, it's been... You want to see the video? Touring. Yeah, Let's we'll see the video, then we'll talk. Excellent. It's called Helping Drew, Anti-Bullying for Kindergarten, Pre-K, up to fifth grade. Great stuff. Let's take a look. Classroom close-up. Used to think I'd have a friend now that thought is at an end is it true what they say maybe i'm not okay cause i'm true just true puppets are amazing something magical happens when the kids see the puppets they really instantly give their heart over to the puppets and the social issues combined with the puppets are a powerful medium because the kids are interested in social issues. They do care about how to be a good friend. They do care about protecting themselves. And when you have a puppet experiencing one of those scenarios, they really want to get involved and, and help out. Students at Bryan Elementary School in Teaneck are learning about kindness and respect, thanks in part to a musical puppet show called Helping Drew which was written by the school's librarian, Alex Ishkanian. I've always had a passion for teaching, and I've also had a passion for performing and writing, and I sort of wanted to combine the two. I'm a kid protector, and I'll keep in touch. But with only two eyes, I might miss much. Uh, originally, it actually started as a one-man show where I was performing each one of the characters and I was lucky enough to run into David Manley of Up in Arms, who uh, is this wonderful puppeteer who uh, was interested in taking the project and making a puppet show. Hey, loser, have you seen Victoria? No. Well, that's good for her. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't want to see your face. <laughs> Why are you so mean to me? Drew is a student at Puppet Public Elementary School, and he is having a bullying uh, issue with another student, Lee. There's another character, Victoria, who really feels very uncomfortable about going along with Lee, but just doesn't know what to do, just can't find the words or the courage to speak up to Lee and say, you know, we shouldn't be doing this to a classmate. Now that's funny, right? Isn't it funny when it's a girl and she's not acting like you think a girl should? No! Sorry, Drew, I apologize, it's true. Now there's so much more and more I see. The story concludes with Drew and Victoria standing up to Lee and Lee reforming his ways, which Ishkanian hopes sends a positive message about change. Kids can change, there's possibilities. We don't want to label, even though we do have that word bully, we want the kids to see that they're not in boxes. So my hope is that we have compassion for all of the people involved in a bullying situation and that we see that there's hope for each one of them and that we don't give up on, on any of them. That is so good. How proud are you? Thank you. you. I'm very proud. Um, and I'm proud of the kids that see the show because they, 
they get it, you know, um, they, they get it. And to hear them, you know, as you could see in the video, the response mm. um, of saying, no, you know, we're not gonna allow that. And um, even the kids, I suppose, that may have bad habits, when they come collectively as a group and see something like that, I think, well, I hope they reflect and, and see that they can do things differently. You know, helping Joe, it's interesting. And we have three young children, and, and I have an older boy who's 21, 20, 22, as we do this show. And I know they have all faced bullying. I pray that, I hope and pray they, they have not bullied mm -hmm. others. I can't be sure. But I always wonder, like, what do they do when they're in that situation? You know, when as parents, we struggle, we, we really worry. And, we, and I look at a video like this, kids need help, don't they? They need to have some direction. Absolutely. Why did you know that? Well, I think uh, as a kid, um, I was- Were you bullied? I was bullied. And, you know, not all the time, but at times. It doesn't take much to stay and with you, right? Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't. And I was, I, the, I was the crier. I think Drew is based uh, partly on what I used to do. I don't think I was crying. I think there was an element of, well, they're going to stop. They're going to see how upset I am. But also it was sincere crying as well. Yeah. I wasn't the kid that would necessarily punch back or, you know, say something really mean back. So, um, you know, I think I could have used a little more sticking up for myself, you know. Or and, someone and else helping to, you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there were people that did that, too. So, And there were times where I didn't treat people so well, either. And, I, you know, I feel badly about that. So if this show can help, um, you know, it's not the answer. One show is not the answer, but it could be part of a program. It triggers a conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you get from the kids afterwards? Oh, gosh. Does well, some of them come up to you and talk to you? Oh, absolutely. And say it's happening to me? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think if you begin that conversation, um, you know, um, they do. They do uh, tell stories about themselves. And um, it's amazing if you just ask kids as young as pre-K and K, they can talk about things that maybe you think you might not ordinarily talk to them about. But if, it, if it's worded on their level, um, they want to share. Our daughter yeah. Olivia is three and a half, and she told me the other day about a kid who was mean to her. She didn't use the word bullying. Right. She said, so-and-so was mean to me. I said, right. why do you think? She said, I don't know. I didn't do anything. I said, how did you feel? And she said, I felt terrible. I exactly. said, would you do that to someone else? She said, no. Now, again, I'm not sure. But it starts at a ridiculously young age. It does. Our kids need yeah, help. It can. That's why, that's why the idea, by the way, log on, get more information. Helping Drew is such a good name for this. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting uh, about the show is that actually the audience ends up helping Victoria, who's that in between. Like, yeah. I don't think this helping is right, Victoria. but you're my, you're such a good friend. So, and then they're helping Lee to find other ways to channel his energy. Um, in this case, he's really not mean spirited. He's more like, isn't this funny? Look at me, you know. But so. then he finds out he's hurting someone. Right, and. He finds out it's really not funny, and that brings up the question of really what is funny, and uh, even society needs to take a look yeah. at what we laugh at because, you know. That... You love your teaching? I do. I love the kids. I went away from it for a while yeah, and then I heard concentrated this really on the arts. Back. Huh? I heard this really brought you back. <laughs> oh, definitely. In a big way. Definitely. Definitely. And... Re-energized you? Definitely. Um, and I get to work at the school that I work at. It's pre-K and K, so that energy is, um, is so alive there. Um, and um, when we brought the show to the school that I work in, Teaneck, um, there was an excitement. They knew I had written it, and uh, it, was big. it was a really nice Well, Alex, nice you're doing event. great stuff, and you make your profession uh, proud, and uh, you're just one of the long line of terrific public school teachers who have joined us in this series. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good stuff. Stay there. One on one will continue right after this. That was great. Oh, thank you. To see more one on one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. 
We are honored to have uh, Ora Welch, who is the president and chief executive officer of an organization called Hope's CAP. Yes. Which stands for? Community Action Partnership. Hope stands for nothing. <laughs> it's just a word that um, delineates what we wish for the community. Hope. Giving people hope. And what do you do? <clears throat> we provide services to people to help them to better their lives. Particularly, we work with the more vulnerable, uh, more disenfranchised, more chal economically challenged mm. community. Is this certain communities? Yes. Where? Well, w our program is headquartered in Hoboken. Right. And I know everybody thinks there are no challenged people in Hoboken. So, so those rich yuppies over there in Hoboken, <laughs> they don't need anything? It's not... We do. It's not really true, is it? It's, it's more complicated really than that. And that's one of the difficulties of working in a community that is perceived to be uh, very, very wealthy. Now, Hoboken wasn't always wealthy. That's right. That's While on fact. the waterfront, 1954 was shot in Hoboken. Exactly. Not everybody is living large over there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So talk about who you serve there. Who are we, they? We, we serve, well, we serve two populations. We serve the low-income, more economically challenged population. But we also serve um, uh, a more um, Are they elderly? advantage. We do serve the elderly, yes. And we serve age groups all the way from birth to death. Interesting. And we were looking at a picture right now of uh, some of the folks that you serve, adult classes that you have? Yes, we have adult classes. And we provide... Uh, assisted transportation. Assisted transportation, mm -hmm. all kinds of work. Uh, that basically is to senior citizens. A lot of senior citizens do not have uh, the support to get to doctors. You got to get to the doctor. You got to go shopping. You got to exactly. do all kinds of things. Exactly. It's interesting. And what about mm -hmm. for kids? We serve the kids too. And How so? Give me an example. Well, we have preschool programs and we have programs for infants. We have both center-based and home-based programs for children. That's beautiful. I remember when I first had my children, and you come home from the hospital, new mother, and now you got this baby. The question <laughs> is, now what? Now what? <laughs> what do I do with it? <laughs> well, one of the things that we do is go into the homes of mothers, young and homes of that are parents are more mature. Do you teach parents to be better parents? We teach parenting skills. We support parents in the process of their learning how to and to care for their children. You know, you know, you know it's so interesting here. Um, the community action, the agency like this, community action partnership, established 1964, right? Yes. Under, Part of, under 1964, Lyndon Johnson. People yes. don't put this together, but they say, okay, let me get this straight. It's 50 years. Lyndon Johnson, part of the so-called Great Society program under yes. Lyndon Johnson. They say, okay, well, it was created to deal with poverty. Yes. So 50 years later, so we don't need that stuff anymore. We don't need a program like that because poverty doesn't exist in the same way. You say? Poverty does exist. Talk about it. Poverty does exist, and I think will always exist until we do something to even up the educational score and the housing score. I think that's what is going to always keep people in poverty. Um, I think that... Is that, what head, is that what Head Start's so important? Head Start is very important because... Children learn 75% 70, of their brain development is in the first five years of their life. By the way, not everyone really knows what Head Start is. It's so interesting. We're looking at some pictures right here. And Head Start's part of what you do as well. Yes. Okay. Head Start is a program that was started. It's a federal program where uh, in the federal government. People often criticize the federal government. We're not, I'm not going to get on a soapbox here. But mm -hmm. people say, oh, what are our, our tax dollars go? Well, one program that is universally acknowledged to be a, a terrific program is Head Start. And it was determined by the federal government, Democrats, Republicans all agreed, uh -huh. that kids often in urban areas and poorer areas, rural as well, they needed an opportunity to get a Head Start. Because yes. if you didn't do it at that point in time, you never right, catch up. they would never, ever catch they up. And that's what Head Start up. was all about. Yes. And so people say, oh, you don't need that anymore. You say. We do need it, and we will continue to need it. One of the things is um, there's, uh, there's not a leveling of the, of the stage with mm. education. And one of the things I think that always uh, I'm concerned about is that people seem to think 
that Head Start is some type of vaccination. You give what? Kid some kind of a, a vaccination you give a kid at age three and four. And, it, and you know, because people always complain that by the time they're four years old, they lose right. that. that like you're done with it. Yes, right. But, but that's, that's, but that's not, not, really not the true. Case. When, you know, when, when they go into a really good supportive school environment, they continue to develop and prosper. Studies have shown mm. that kids who have had a head start a much better um, socially and economically when they get to the older. Dave, do better. But yes. the other thing is, let's talk about this. Teenagers, particularly in struggling socioeconomic areas, deal with a whole range of issues. Now, you were born and raised in Alabama. Yes. Which I would argue is not often confused with New Jersey. Not at all. Um, and especially not in the years that I grew up there. What impact, I gotta ask you this before I let you out of here. What impact did growing up where you did, how you did, have an impact on what you do today? I think it does because it was the way I, I grew up. I grew up having some responsibility for my community mm. and for the people in my community. And that gave me, I think, the impetus of, for working, doing what I do now. Did it really? I started out in this work as a volunteer. And I began to love it more and more and as a volunteer in a community organization, I was hired. And I love doing what I do. I, I just, I, it's I guess passion? such, it's my passion. And I think if you, this is said that if you find a, uh, a, a job or a, you'll never work, you'll a, day never work a day in your life. I Keep never doing what you're doing. work a day in my life. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was great. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Ohlendorf Center, Cohn Resnick, the Fidelco Group, Bedway Associates, and by United Water. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. An aneurysm almost took my life. When I needed a heart transplant, survival rates mattered to me. An irregular heartbeat could have ended my life. I came to Robert Wood Johnson, and they repaired it through a hole smaller than a dime. But thanks to robotic technology at RWJ, I'm still here. That's why I chose RWJ. At Robert Wood Johnson, being the best means breakthroughs in cardiovascular care happen every day. RWJ and Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, the heart of academic medicine.